Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my esteemed pleasure to be here to support Joseph Boncori for the first Suffolk and Middlesex Senate seat. There is no question. You know, not only are we Winthrop natives, which I am, but my father was born in Revere and raised there. My mother was born in East Boston. My grandparents lived in Sacred Heart Parish before they moved to Winthrop. And my parents actually met at the, at the uh, Spanish Gables down on Revere Beach. So we're going back a ways. Now, I know this district as well as anyone because I run in all of the part, this part of the district except for that little part of Cambridge. <coughs> <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> easy, easy. But <laughs> I'm only teasing. I'm only teasing. We got some relatives there. Yeah, well, thank God. They're going to vote about five more times. So. But you know, we, we're here not about me. We're not here about anyone other than Joe Boncori. And the reason why we're here is because he is the perfect choice in the Senate at this time. He is not only an accomplished attorney, we all know that. I know that because I swore him in too. <laughs> but let me tell you something, you know, public service is a calling. And it isn't something you just decide, oh, I think I'll become a senator. He's been doing the work of serving the people in this neighborhood, or these neighborhoods, for all of his life. And it's someone like that who knows the neighborhoods, who cares about the neighborhoods, who can be your strong voice. That's so important, because he will give 150% every single day. Every single day. just wake up and decide that he should become a senator, the Honorable Joseph Boncori. He is very concerned and works so hard, particularly in this day and age, with the problems of opiate addiction, with the problems of housing, with the problems of mental illness. This is killing people all the time. And here we have a young man who has already demonstrated his uh, concern, his passion to fight for those issues that affect everyone, regardless of your age, regardless of your class, regardless of your color, it doesn't matter. So I personally am going to urge all of you to go for Joe. You gotta go for Joe. You know, you always gotta, um, everyone in this room has been loyal to Doyle, so it's now time for you to go for Joe. So I'd like to bring up now the next senator from the 1st Suffolk and Middlesex District, Joe Boncori. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for that wonderful introduction. My, my, my pleasure, sir. I'm just glad no one ran out to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> it is an honor to have the first woman elected as a clerk of this Commonwealth's highest court to introduce me as we kick off our campaign. She's been an inspiration to me as an elected official and public servant in this Commonwealth, and I'm proud to call her my friend. Thank you, Clerk.
And I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and taking the time to join me tonight. It means the world. I want to thank the volunteers that have been with me since December, that are working so hard every day to bring us to where we are today. But really, I want to thank all of you again. I'd like, like to recognize some special people who are here today. My family. Okay. My father and my mother, my seven sisters, and my one brother, and their families. And I'd like to recognize Sarah, who not only over the last year and a half has had to adjust to joining a large family in a small community, but more recently adjusted to this campaign. You know, I suspect my family probably makes up 30%. <laughs> But I know by the end of it, you, by, they're going to be so loud, you're going to think they make up 90%. <laughs> and uh, I didn't forget you, Nana. <laughs> 90 when, 91 years old. Young. <laughs> and she's my number one biggest supporter. You'd know that if you've been to Stop and Shop in the last few weeks. <laughs> are in Red's hair salon getting your hair done. She'll tell you how proud she is of me. But it really is how proud I am of her. And it was her family that arrived to this community facing the challenges that even so many new immigrants face today. It was her hard work and her self-made mentality that gave my family the opportunity to flourish in this community. But, but more than that, for me, it was the instillment and ingrainment of not forgetting where you come from that my mother would constantly remind me of. It was a sense of public service that my father has exemplified for his entire career in various civic organizations and as Winthrop's town councilor for the past 10 years. Thank you. You see, my family believe, raised me to believe in public service. And these neighborhoods have provided me and my family with so much opportunity that public service to this community is just a natural calling. It was that same opportunity that provided me, fresh out of law school, to join the board at the Winthrop Housing Authority. And I see some people over here from the authority. You know, as a young attorney, eager to get involved in any way I could, when I got, when I got appointed to the board, I quickly apprised myself of all the laws governing the Housing Authority and policies that drove the Housing Authority. But nothing could have prepared me for the human element of service. You know, you can see on statistics, you can see statistics on paper and numbers on a budget and hear about the housing needs for our seniors and our disabled. But you can't prepare for the raw emotion of people in need. I'm reminded of a story when, about, as soon as I got on the Housing Authority, I was there about a week. And I was sitting in the office, and a young family I knew from Winthrop came into that office. A father who I had known and had grown up, he was only a few years older than me. And he came in, and he was very thankful. He was probably a little embarrassed because he was talking to me about it, but yet he was thankful. His family had just lost everything. His, he lost his job, his wife had lost hers, and together they lost their home. He had told me, you know, they would have been all right. They would have moved on. They would have persevered. Just a, a week before this, but we, we offered them the apartment. They were slated to move up to New Hampshire to live with his in-laws. But he told me, it's not me I was worried about. It's my children I'm worried about. If we live in New Hampshire, it would have been our children that would have been displaced from this community, displaced from their schools mid-year and displaced from the, men, the many friends that they had made along the way. And that's when it hit to me that safe and afford, affordable housing is more than a place to house our most vulnerable citizens in society. But it's a tool to help families in crisis. It provides a safety net for families in our communities. And that family, I'm happy to report, was only in housing for a short time and used it as a transition. They're now back in a home of their own and still living in Winthrop today. But, but 
But for every one family that we were able to help, there is another that we cannot keep in the community. There are innumerable humbling stories about children who are uprooted and parents who lose their support systems and communities that are torn apart when housing is not available. We cannot allow this to continue. We as a commonwealth must invest in affordable and emergency housing so no family is torn from their foundations and no child is pulled from a school district mid-school year. I promoted this and I promoted these programs as chairman of the Winthrop Housing Authority. I've advocated on Beacon Hill along with Anthony Petroselli for affordable housing and I will continue to champion these programs when I'm your next city senator. And a word about Anthony Petroselli. You know, when Anthony called me in mid-December and told me that he'd be resigning the seat in the coming weeks. I had a lot of emotions. I was immediately saddened, saddened that our community would be losing such a strong voice and advocate on Beacon Hill. I've been proud to have him, my, have him as my senator, but I'm more proud to have him as a friend. And I wish him and Alessandra on the best in their future. But then I quickly be began to think about the future of our district, the future of this district. Our communities are still facing profound challenges, not just low-income housing, but housing in general. I know our neighborhoods today are faced with uncoordinated development that threatens to displace people and break the very fabric of our communities. Although we shouldn't stop communities from developing, we must work on smart growth strategies so our communities can keep their identity and take an approach that mitigates these issues for their neighbors. Last winter provided, approved, what transit experts have been saying for years. We have allowed our transportation infrastructure to fall apart in this commonwealth. When public transportation falls apart, so too does our economy. E-mobility is the number one reason for poverty in our society. We as, a community, we as a government need to reinvest in the MBTA. We must, as a commonwealth, give people the means to go to work. The jobs are key, and a living wage is essential. And strong unions are critical to that end. However, when people get jobs, we need to make it available and allow people to keep those jobs. I see it in my own family, with my siblings, my brothers and sisters, as they have ch children with a rising and soaring cost of child care. With another child comes the, the, the question as to whether or not one parent stays home and, le and leaves their job. And parents leaving the workforce does nothing to stimulate this economy. We need to make pre-K education universal throughout this commonwealth. We need to keep parents in the workforce and prepare our children for their future. These are the challenges that are felt here in Revere, in my home in Winthrop, and throughout the neighborhoods of Boston, and even Cambridge. <laughs> These communities have welcomed my family as we arrived in this country in search of a better life. And these are the communities that have been the base for my family's small business over the last 40 years. It is because of these communities that I have given so much and that I am so passionate about solving the problems that affect these communities. It is why for my entire career I've worked towards solutions to solve these problems in these communities. My experience and, so and passion for solving problems facing our citizens every day is the single number one reason that I am running to serve as your next state senator. <laughs> one issue I often see in my work in the district courts as a public defender is the issue of mental illness. Mental illness in our society is so misunderstood by our courts and even our very healthcare system. 
as a public defender working for Suffolk Lawyers for Justice, on my duty days when I'm assigned a person, I would say that the greater part of 70%, 70% of these people have some sort of mental health disorder. With our health care system the, the way it is currently, most of those people have been diagnosed but the resources aren't available to treat those people. They have no access to treatment, no access to the, to the medications that can, that can help them get past their mental illnesses or, co or cope with their mental illnesses. But more often it's true that these mental illness, health illnesses and people go undiagnosed. They're never diagnosed as a child, as a teenager, and then as an adult. And by the, by the time they enter the criminal justice system, they're sent to jails that usually exacerbate their symptoms. And when they have left prison, they, they have not developed any meaningful way to enter back into society and build a productive life. In society, we must invest into mental health resources so people have access. We must ensure that both law enforcement and courts are personally equipped with laws and training to help those suffering from mental health illnesses. As we know, when we don't treat those mental health illnesses and when we lack those resources, people often turn to drugs for relief and begin the unforgiving process of self-medication. When speaking of challenges to families in our communities, there are few that are more heartbreaking than the opiate epidemic that plagues our neighborhoods throughout this district. I'd venture to guess there's no one in this room who hasn't been touched by it. The stories being played out here in this district and all across the Commonwealth. The epidemic of drug addiction is destroying the lives of people, destroying families and tearing apart the communities that we live in. In my practice in the criminal district courts, I see it every day. And I see that our criminal justice system has not and cannot solve this crisis. We can no longer look at addiction as a crime. It's not. Addiction is a disease. And the only way to cure that disease is treating it with doctors and nurses and therapists and not with police officers, public defenders, and court officers. You know, I'm sick and tired of attending funerals of friends that I grew up with in my neighborhood. They went to the same schools as me, came from a similar background and had a similar family base than me. And I know we're all sick of it. And I know there's more we can do to stop it. You know, I had a friend, um, you know, we grew up in Winthrop together. We were very close in grade school. We were very close, inseparable almost, through middle school. We, had, we played Little League together and other sports together. Um, when high school separated us, we began and ended up in different circles. After a couple routine surgeries to fix a football injury, he became addicted to prescription painkillers. Over the years, these problems, as they typically do, became worse because they were going untreated. And as the problems got worse, the drugs became more hardcore. I went into court one day on my duty day as a public defender. I got my client list, and there was my friend's name. Here in an intersection of my past and my present colliding, I met with my friend in lockup that day. And he was sick. I knew the jail wasn't the place for him. But I knew that the streets would mean that his would be the next funeral that I attended. That day, we were able to defer his case and get him secure him a bed at the Salvation Army. And a year later, instead of having to go to his funeral, he's here tonight at this kickoff. I'm so proud to have him here today as he gets closer to one year of sobriety. You know, he's here today because he believes in, 
in me. But I'm running because I believe in him. And I believe in cases like his. And I see that the Senate is a place to make that change and change how the courts view this disease and fund doctors and nurses to treat this disease. It's experiences like this that make me believe in people. It makes me believe in change. And it makes me believe that we need advocates on Beacon Hill with the practical experience to effectuate that change. And that's what this campaign is all about. Our campaign is about practical an efficient and an effective approach to the problems and the issues that affect our neighborhoods and our families. You know, you have a choice here. You can choose to vote for someone who believes in an ivory tower idealism and who will subsequently, when elected, vote in that line with that agenda. Or you can vote for someone that sees the real world challenges that my clients face every day. Someone that sees the problems my neighbors face every day. And someone who, faith, who sees the problems that our community faces every day. There's too much important work to be done to have grand philosophical debates. Our communities need a senator who is going to be able to collaborate with leadership to pass laws that help people and move this district forward. A senator who will work with local leaders to see what our neighborhoods need and what our city needs most, and ultimately place those needs ahead of ideology. Thank you. That is what I believe this is. This, can't, this campaign's about, and I'm telling you, this is what this campaign's about. Campaigning is difficult, I will tell you, too. <laughs> it often requires that I'm up at 6 a.m. and out of the house. It requires me to only sleep three or four hours a night. You know, but I'm happy to do it. Because although I'm not in court these days because I'm out campaigning, I know that there are people who are still in those courts. People afflicted with mental illness, people afflicted with opiate addiction, and they're still in court every day. And if we're funneling them into a system that fails them at every level. And that, this campaign is about them. This campaign is about the parent who too only sleeps three and four hours a day, but it's because they're working two or three jobs a night, because they're terrified that they won't be able to keep a roof over our, their child's head in communities with rent rising the way it does. This campaign is about school-age children who wake up at that same time at 6 a.m. because they have to catch a bus and a train if that MBTA train is working that day, <laughs> and another bus to ensure that they have the access to a quality education. But this campaign is about you, the voter and member of this community. I'm running to be your voice on Beacon Hill. And I'm running to join, to have you join me in that voice to say we can do better. We must do better. And we will do better. But I need, I need your support, and I need that enthusiasm I just heard. And I'm going to need that enthusiasm as we talk to our neighbors at their doors over the next two months, as we talk to our neighbors on the phone over the next few months. I'm going to need your generosity to enable my cam our campaign to get our message out to the voters. And we're going to need your help between now and April 12th to bring our team to the State Senate. Most importantly, I'm going to need your trust. And I'm going to need your vote. And I promise to spend every day from now, from now until April 12th to earn your support 
every day proving myself worthy of the trust you've given me and bringing that same level of trust and energy that I bring to this campaign as I work for you as your next state senator. I need you all. This campaign isn't about me. This campaign is about you. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless your families, our communities, and this Commonwealth.